Welcome to this Royal Holloway Geography for Schools lecture. My name's Katie Willis and I'm a human geography lecturer in the department and it's a great pleasure to be with you to talk about uh, migration, international migration, in this lecture which is entitled People on the Move, Causes and Consequences of Migration. If we look at the world today, we get maps like this. So if we're thinking about international migration, we might think about large numbers of people living in places like the United States, that big purple blob over there on the left hand side of this map. But basically what we've got is that international migration is found throughout the world. And actually, if we looked at migration as a percentage of the population, the, the map would probably look very different. If you want to do that, just go onto this IOM website and you can play around with its interactive data sources. But international migration is a key characteristic of global demographics in the 21st century. But what I want to do in this lecture is think generally about causes and consequences of migration. But because we're geographers, we want to think very carefully about context, I then want to think about two case studies, case study of Singapore and then a case study of Mexico before we go on to thinking about some conclusions. So let's start off with a definition. And even though migration is clearly something that takes place within boundaries of a nation state, in this lecture, I'm going to focus on international migration. And according to the IOM, the International Organization for Migration, an international migrant is any person who changes his or her country of usual residence. And as we often have in geography definitions, if we really start to think about this, it becomes much more complicated than we first think. The importance of diversity. Why do people migrate? We may have people who are migrating for employment, for education, for generally a better standard of living. They may be fleeing persecution or a natural disaster. They may even be being trafficked, so being forced to migrate. Who is migrating? We are all different. We have different genders, ages, education and income levels. We belong to different religious or ethnic or racial groups and so on and so on. And that will affect why we are migrating, if we are migrating and our experiences of that migration. Where are we migrating from and also where to? Those different kind of flows of migration represent potentially very different causes, consequences and experiences. How are migrants traveling? Are they migrating by themselves? Are they migrating with other people? Are they traveling? What form of transport are they using? Plane, bus, train, boat, walking? How long are they traveling for? Is it a planned, uh, is it a planned period of migration for one, two years or permanently? Or is it much shorter? The IOM says that uh, you can have migration from anything from three months upwards in terms of permanent residence. So all these things mean that we've got a very diverse nature of people who are migrating, but also where and for what reason, which means that we have to think very carefully about uh, making sweeping generalizations around the causes and consequences of migration. And my aim in the rest of this lecture is really to get you thinking about that kind of diversity um, and what that means for understanding and explaining international migration in the 21st century. So causes and consequences, things to bear in mind. What theoretical approach is being used in a particular analysis? What about variations by scale? 
causes and consequences might vary depending on whether we're talking about individuals, households, communities, countries. So we need to think about uh, what spatial scale. The differences between different parts of the world. You know, we saw that global map start of the lecture. Things may be different if we're talking about international migration within a continent, potentially within Africa or within Asia, compared to between uh, global regions. We need to think about those spatial differences. And of course, we have to remember that there are changes over time. Things that may have been true a decade, a century ago, may not be so relevant now. If we think about causes, we often start off with thinking about this idea of push and pull factors, drawing on Lee's work in the 1960s. But we might think about our place of origin has got positive and negative or neutral factors, and that they may be pushing us towards a destination that again may have positive negative or neutral factors. But there are obstacles. Those obstacles may be things like money. How much does it cost to migrate? It might be things around social norms. Are there obstacles which mean that certain kinds of people are not seen as um, being able to migrate? Maybe there are parts of the world where there are expectations that women shouldn't move around compared to men. And then, of course, if we're talking about international migration, we've got the very significant potential obstacles of border and boundary restrictions, visa requirements, border walls, border control points, and your ability to get through those borders are not equal, but they vary very much on your particular circumstances and the rules and regulations of the country that you're entering. The world surface is not frictionless in terms of our ability to move around it. And some of us can move more easily than others. We also have to think in terms of the causes, the scale of analysis. Again, are we thinking about individuals, households, communities, nations? And also the theoretical approach that's been adopted. So the push and pull factors is the good starting point, but we have to think very carefully about how we're using those ideas in order to understand a particular flow of migration. So if we're thinking about causes of migration, there are lots of different theoretical approaches to trying to understand migration. And I'm just going to pick up on three here because they help us understand some of the broader Kind of categories of theories that you might come across. The first is what's sometimes called a neoclassical economic approach, trying to understand migration as in terms of uh, work opportunities, labour opportunities being different between different places. And people will migrate to places where there are more job opportunities or better wages or uh, job um, the potential for advancement. And the idea is often that that migration will continue until, in a sense, there's a levelling up, because more migrants might lead to declining wage levels, which might lead to a kind of balancing up of the work opportunities in different places. However, a structuralist approach would say that migration is to do with inequality between locations, in our case, between different countries. And actually what happens as you get migration is that the inequalities between those places increase. Because often the people who are migrating for work are the people who are more educated, the people who are more dynamic and entrepreneurial, the people who potentially are able to contribute more to where they're going. So in a sense, they then leave a deficit, a brain drain from where they have left and contribute to the growing economic growth and advancement of where they're going to, which again then drives inequality and leads to more migration. 
So you can see these two particular kind of approaches um, are quite different in their uh, starting points, although they both deal with labour migration. What you often find now is that theoretical approaches or the approaches that particular researchers adopt may have a mixture of these two different approaches. Then we also get something at a, a different scale. So the neoclassical economic approach and the structuralist approach are quite macro in their approach. They're thinking about quite a large scale, potentially between one country and another country. A household strategy approach, however, brings us down to a different scale, makes us think about migrants living within households, so a much smaller spatial scale, and also brings in ideas about the constitution of a household, maybe in terms of gender or in terms of age, and tries to think about how do migration decisions, how are they made within households? Is migration needed? Who is available to migrate? Where should they go to in order to maximise the benefits for that household? So as I said, there are lots of different theoretical approaches to migration. These will just help you, help you think about, potentially are we thinking about macro or smaller, more micro scale approaches? And also thinking about whether we have potentially a more optimistic approach to migration, as the neoclassical approach suggests, or potentially a more pessimistic approach to migration, which is the structuralist approach, which sees migration as exacerbating inequality. Another thing we have to think about are who are the actors in migration decisions? And those actors may be individuals or groups, institutions or organizations. So obviously we've got the person who is migrating or might be migrating. We've got the migrant's family, but we've also got at a different scale, governments, national governments, local governments in both the sending and the receiving countries. We've got companies that might be looking for particular kinds of labor that they can't get locally. We've got the migrant communities of origin. Where are people migrating from? How are those communities involved in those decisions? potentially encouraging or potentially discouraging migration. And we've also got the migrant, migrant destination communities. Are they welcoming to migrants? If they are welcoming, is it for all migrants? Only particular kinds of migrants or migrants who are seen as being appropriate or people who will fit in to uh, the destination community. So that means there will be lots of varied consequences depending on the actors involved and where and when they are going. A really important part of migration decisions in terms of international migration is issues around improving yourself economically. And if we're thinking about uh, flows of money associated with migration, we often use the term remittances. So remittances, is the term given to uh, financial flows sent by migrants back to their communities of origin. These can also be within a country, but here we're going to talk between one country and another country. And really importantly for us thinking about the consequences of migration is the amount of money that is involved. Here we've got a graph uh, which is showing uh, financial flows to low and middle income countries. So these are a category of countries that are defined by the World Bank as being low or middle income. And here we've got the flows of money uh, to low and middle income countries from 1990 up to 2019. And we've got four different kinds of flows here. The gray line, which is at the bottom, is ODA official development assistance, the kind of official name for what is sometimes termed aid. And when we're thinking about financial flows to low and middle income countries, we often assume that aid is the most important. But this graph clearly shows that while aid is, you know, about $100 billion, which is 
no mean amount. It's a very, very small percentage compared to other forms of financial flows. The brown line is FDI, foreign direct investment. And we can see that that's increased massively in the 21st century. It goes up and down a bit to do with uh, economic recession, but it's a very significant amount of money which flows to low and middle income countries. The green line is private debt and portfolio equity. So things like stocks and shares. And you can see this fluctuates a great deal as you would expect given the fluctuations in stock markets. But of course, for this lecture, what's really important is the red line, the remittances line. Here we've got the fact that remittances have been going up and up and up and up, and as of 2019, were the most important flow of financial flow to lower middle income countries. So in other words, migration is a phenomenally important source of finance for low and middle income countries, for both the people who live in those countries, the households and the family members of migrants, but also potentially for governments uh, who might want to use or encourage the use of that remittance uh, to uh, invest in economic growth generating activity. And again, just to give you an idea about flows, more fantastic data from the IOM showing how uh, which countries receive the most remittances. India there in 2020 with 83.2 billion US dollars of remittances. Clearly, this is the largest in terms of amount. If you look at individual countries, you can see how remittances stack up against GDP. And in some cases, remittances are equal to a very significant percentage of GDP. So if that's our general kind of set of arguments about causes and consequences of migration, let's now start thinking about specific contexts. So I'm going to start off by thinking about Singapore. So Singapore, as of, uh, is a uh, island nation off the southern coast of the Malaysian Peninsula. It's a city state. Um, and as of June 2021, it had a population of 5.45 million people. So a, a small population. And of those, 3.5 million were resident citizens. So they had a Singapore passport. An additional nearly half a million were permanent residents, people who have uh, a passport from a different country, but were had the permission to stay permanently in Singapore. But that means that nearly 1.5 million people were what are termed non-residents, people with passports of another country. 1.5 million of an overall population of 5.45 million. So here we've got a very, very significant importance of immigration to the population of Singapore. We can say that Singapore at the moment is a country of net immigration. There are Singaporeans who live and work in other countries, but Singapore could in, at the moment is a country of net immigration. But before we start talking about the contemporary period, we of course have to remember that Singapore's population, now its citizenship, draws on a history of immigration, which has created the multi-ethnic society that is now Singapore. Singapore, um, part of the British Empire uh, from the kind of early to mid 19th century, um, led to a massive influx of migrants from around uh, Southeast and East Asia coming and working in what was a really significant trading point um, in the British Empire. And so now you've got uh, a population uh, that by ethnicity falls into three main groups. And the way that the Singapore government categorizes its population is that it uh, identifies you as being Malay, uh, 
Chinese or Indian, with a very small percentage being other. And one of the key consequences of these historical migration flows is that since Singapore became independent in 1965, there's been a very strong uh, process of nation building, trying to kind of stress the multi-ethnic, the multicultural nature of Singapore, with things like having official languages, not just of English, but also of Malay, Chinese, Mandarin, and Tamil, so the main Indian language of people who came from South India. Also having public holidays, which reflect the main religions of those groups, trying to again say we are all part of a multi-ethnic, <coughs> multicultural nation. We are Singaporeans uh, and we are a multicultural, multi-ethnic society. And similarly, the Singapore government has used its ownership of most of the housing in Singapore to try and stop there being uh, kind of um, ethnic enclaves where and trying to encourage mixing across ethnic groups. In terms of contemporary migration, we have to think about what uh, Singapore now is. Singapore is an incredibly uh, prosperous country with a high um, standard of living for its citizens, incredible things like this, the Marina Bay Sands kind of uh, complex, hotels, gambling. Also uh, Singapore incredibly important for services such as banking, real estate, insurance, marketing, and so on. It's become this really important hub in the region, building on its trade, uh, its trade hub um, status from earlier times. But in terms of migration, migrants have been really important to the growth of Singapore. But this migration in its contemporary period is very much stratified, or if you like, bifurcated. And this is reflected in migration governance, whereby it has two main strands of migration. A migration strand that is to do with skilled personnel and a migration uh, flow that is to do with unskilled workers. Reflecting the needs of the Singapore economy, requiring people who are going to help build buildings like this, but are also going to work as domestic servants, um, helping free up female labour for women to go out into the labour force. So you have someone who is doing the housework and doing the childcare, but also reflecting the fact that you've got an ageing population and you need people to care for the elderly, particularly in their own homes, because uh, homes for the elderly outside of the domestic uh, environment are not very common. So you need people who are going to work domestically, but also as construction workers. But you also need people who are going to work in the highly skilled industries that are kind of growing the Singapore economy. So you have these two different strands of employment. And these are what the Singapore government, the Singapore government feels is needed uh, for the success of Singapore and has really helped contribute to its success. And this is reflected in terms of uh, migration diversity, in terms of uh, the different employment processes. And here we've got a table who compares the employment pass or the S pass, which is for highly skilled or mid skilled workers. And as of December 2021, there were just over 300,000 people in Singapore on those kind of employment passes. For people on work permits, these are people who are seen as unskilled workers, working in construction, shipyard activity, so they would be men, or in domestic work, they would be women. And as of December 2021, there were nearly 850,000 people on those kind of permits. And you'll notice here that I've got the, the notion of skill in inverted commas, because clearly the idea of skill is very much a defined uh, category, it's not a, a category that everybody would agree on. What is seen as skilled and unskilled is a very political decision. And you can see in terms of where people come from, are people who come on a work permit 
Bangladesh, China, India, Indonesia, Myanmar, the Philippines. So very kind of regional. Whereas people who come on employment passes may come from the UK, the USA, other parts of Western Europe, Australia, New Zealand, but also may come from the region, from China and India. So people who have Chinese nationality or Indian nationality may actually be either on a work permit or as an employment pass. So skilled migrants and unskilled migrants can come from the same countries, but their experiences would be very different. According to the Singaporean migration rules, if you are on an employment pass or an S pass, you can apply for permanent residency after some time. You can bring your family with you, so your partner or your children, and you would if you wanted to be able to marry a Singaporean. If, however, you're on a work permit, you're not allowed to do any of those things. So we can see that while both sets of migrants may be coming to improve their uh, economic status, have a different kind of quality of life, actually their experiences will be very different depending on the kind of uh, migration status that they have. So again, thinking about migration uh, diversity. People on an employment pass or an S pass will be able to live in, you know, quite kind of high end uh, uh, accommodation. People who are on work permits, if you're a construction worker, you will probably be living in uh, accommodation dormitories on the construction site. If you're a domestic worker, you're probably going to be living with the family that employs you. So a very different kind of migration experience. Interestingly enough, the Singapore government is changing its migration rules for the highly skilled migrants uh, in late 2022 to reflect more of a points system and partly also to reflect some of the tensions that there have been from Singaporean citizens about skilled migrants coming and potentially being seen to limit their job opportunities. They're not uh, worried about unskilled migrants because those are not the jobs they want to do. They're more worried about potentially people who are coming and seeing as a threat uh, to their job opportunity. Let's now move to Mexico, a very different part of the world, but here we've got a similar skyline uh, in terms of our high rise buildings uh, that we had in uh, Singapore. In terms of demographic information, obviously the population of uh, Mexico much, much larger than Singapore, over 100 million people in 2020. But if we look at the percentage of foreigners, 1.2 million foreigners, so a really, really small percentage of the population in Mexico. So again, a very different situation from Singapore. And most of those uh, foreigners, people with a foreign passport, uh, come from the US. They may be people who have Mexican heritage who have come to uh, live in the USA. If we think about Mexicans living outside Mexico, 11.2 million Mexicans lived outside Mexico in 2020, which nearly all of them lived in the USA. And overall, we can say that Mexico is a net emigration country, but there have been changes about that over time. Again, if we're thinking about Mexican history, 15, uh, in the 16th century, uh, Europeans arrived in Mexico. So you would have had an indigenous population there at the time. Europeans arrived and over time settled uh, and there were mixing between indigenous and European populations. So you now have a large percentage of the Mexican population is of mixed indigenous and European heritage. You obviously still have people who have uh, indigenous identity. And you've also got a significant percentage of the population who are Afro-Mexicans. So people who are descendant from uh, people who arrived in Mexico either as enslaved peoples or as freed, uh, liberated uh, slaves from elsewhere in the region. So migration has contributed to the diversity of Mexico's current population. 
So let's have a think about this migration to the USA. So the first thing to say is that even though uh, the images in the media are often of people trying to cross the, U the Mexican US border without documentation, trying to get through the desert to get across the Rio Grande, in fact, many, many people enter uh, the USA to live and work uh, with legal documentation, maybe through to get permanent legal residence through the green card system, or for, as temporary workers. That might be as a farm worker. So between uh, October 2019 and September 2020, nearly 200,000 people were given, Mexicans were given visas to go and work as farm workers in the USA. There are also visa schemes to work in industry, but there are also visa schemes to work in more skilled occupations. But we also do have people who are entering the US from Mexico without the documentation that the US government requires. So we've got these flows. So people are trying to, to move to the USA for employment, and they may use different uh, routes uh, for that. However, if we look at this uh, graph on the right hand side, this is taken from uh, the work of Ana Gonzalez Barrera at the Pew Research Center. We can see that net migration between Mexico and the US varies greatly. We've got periods where there is a very, very significant imbalance between the number of uh, Mexicans going to the US and the number returning. Um, and that's very much the case between 1995 and 2000. But since then, we've had kind of shifts. We've had more equal periods or periods where it's slightly more returning than going. And that reflects uh, recession in the US, less labor demand in the US. It also reflects periods where the Mexican economy is doing better and therefore people can have job opportunities in Mexico. It also reflects things like demographics. Mexican fertility rates going down, meaning that households or families um, have less of a need for people to migrate to get income for a larger family. There's also the times when you might have more border controls, immigration restrictions. So we can see that even though there are significant flows from Mexico to the USA, there have been shifts over time, and we need to be very, very careful of making assumptions about these things. But generally, migration from Mexico to the US is associated with economic migration, trying to get uh, a better job, whether you're a farm worker or whether you're a highly skilled university educated professional. What are the consequences of this migration from the US, sorry, from Mexico to the US? The first thing is clearly the remittances. And we saw in an earlier slide about the billions of dollars that flow from the US, uh, flow into Mexico from outside uh, the country, and most of that will come from the US. But remittances also flow to individual households and communities. And you get the idea of remittance houses, houses that are built with remittances, such as this picture here, taken by Sarah Lopez, of a house that was built in the state of Jalisco. Remittances might also be spent on things like education for children, healthcare, and so on. So it could be to do with consumption and housing, as we've got in this image, but also on other investment for the next generation. There also may be consequences of sending the sending communities demographics, for example, uh, rural communities in southern Mexico, where you have very, very few people living there apart from younger children and the elderly or the infirm, because adults who are healthy enough to migrate have migrated away, either to elsewhere in Mexico or to the US. And that means that your demographic profile in your sending communities is very different. Or it might mean that men are more likely to go, meaning that women take on more uh, decision-making power in a community. There are clearly individual hardships in terms of a journey. 
whether you are uh, migrating into the US as a documented or an undocumented migrant. Individual hardships of people left behind, but also being separated from your family when you're living and working in the US. And I think we shouldn't forget that because I think we often do when we think about the macro level. Doesn't mean to say there are very positive things about individuals migrating, but it's also a very difficult and challenging situation. At a macro level, the contributions to the US economy, those visas, that, those, those permits that are given for agricultural workers to go into the US, incredibly important for particular parts of the US, the economy would collapse without its migrant labor. But it comes with political tensions within communities in the US, but also clearly political tensions between national governments. Uh, we obviously are familiar with the uh, President Trump and his idea about the border wall and his representations of Mexicans uh, as being kind of criminals and dangerous and incredibly problematic and racist uh, kind of uh, set of discourses around Mexicans, but also. Uh, the kind of tensions that come around uh, the, the routes through Mexico of Central American uh, migrants who are trying to get to the US for a better and more secure life. So a range of different consequences that come at different scales from these migration flows. And these transit routes are really important. You know, tens of thousands of people um, move into Mexico every year from Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua. Some of them will be seeking to stay in Mexico. Others will be seeking to go through Mexico to try and get to the US through uh, various border points. And again, they may be uh, trying to get through with legal documentation, but they may also not have the appropriate paperwork and therefore be undocumented uh, migrants. And again, for these migrants, they, have, they are trying to navigate a border in the south uh, and the Mexican um, security forces will be trying to control that migration because they see uh, some problems with Central American migrants coming in. Also, uh, they've had agreements with the US government to try and stop Central American migrants coming in. So they're trying to stop that border and then, um, the Central American migrants are at the mercy of uh, the people who are smuggling them across the border and potentially are uh, exposing them to kind of violence through their journey and then trying to get across the border in the north to the USA. So again, the consequences of Mexico as a transit space, not just a place of emigration or immigration for Mexicans. So by way of conclusion, international migration is highly diverse, a really important message. And again, one you really have to remember when we're thinking about making sweeping generalizations about international migration. There are different theoretical approaches to exploring and explaining migration patterns. And whenever we look at a particular migration issue, we need to think about what theoretical approach is being adopted or which might be suitable. The causes and consequences of migration vary between actors. So think about you know, who is doing the migrating, consequences for whom, and so on. The spatial and temporal scales. Are we thinking macro? Are we thinking about very small? Are we thinking about contemporary? Are we thinking about the past? And clearly, there are regional variations. For those of you who are interested, these are the sources of the information I've presented uh, in uh, this lecture. Um, and if you want more information about both the geography department, but also about uh, the school's lectures, uh, please uh, follow uh, these uh, links. Uh, I hope you found this uh, uh, interesting and helpful, and uh, I hope to uh, Hear, for, hear from you if you've got any questions about the lecture.